Today on Growing Boulder, are you doing what you love? And if not, why not? One musician hopes his near-death experience will help you embrace the opportunity that every day provides. Then... We have to push each other a little bit, yeah. but after we ski, we feel we better. Feel so better. we know we need to do it. Growing Boulder in the water and out of it. How they're pushing each other to greatness and smashing a few stereotypes along the way and the power of acknowledgement. We're shining the spotlight on ordinary people who are rebranding aging, confronting ageism, and making the world a better place for all. Right now on Growing Boulder. The moral of the story is really follow your heart. Live your life to the fullest. Don't let anyone tell you that you can't do it. So get out there, take some chances, find something you love, and make it your lifestyle. Make no mistake about it, it's a revolution. Hello and welcome again to Growing Boulder, the show that delivers the big three. We're talking about hope, inspiration, and possibility. I'm Mark Middleton. And I'm Bill Schaefer, and we're here at the Growing Boulder House in Lake Nona, Florida. I want to tell you about this study. It shows that most of our waking moments are spent either at work or thinking about work. So is your job your passion? Do you do it just to pay the bills? If you didn't need the money, would you keep on doing it? Here's a story of an amazing musician who had no idea how much he missed performing until something happened that nearly silenced him forever. They looked at me and said, yeah, if you hadn't brought him in 24 hours from now, he would have been dead. Robbie Steinhardt had no idea how sick he was. I didn't feel like I was dying, you know? Um, so you have to let especially if you have people around that love you, you need to listen to what the hell they're saying. After all, we've been listening to Robbie for decades as singer and violinist in the band Kansas with hits like this. All we are is dust in the wind. You would never dream in a million years that would happen to you, something that became that popular. Um, it's been played, I mean, something like 15 million times around the world, you know, TV and radio and all that. And now here he was in the hospital wondering if this was it. So you have this quintuple bypass yes. surgery. Yes. Five days later, you wake up? Yes. A, a little over four days. That's true. You know this. <laughs> you know more about me than I do. See, but I don't remember any of those four days, which is great. And... You want to hear something even amazing? The, all the symptoms of male heart attack, they say that um, the, the tingling in the left arm, the elephant on the chest, all that. I never went through any of that. And then I come out 50, in the hospital for 52 days. I come out, I have no pain here, no heart pain, no pain in the incision. I've never felt any pain from the operation. It's like it never happened. Except I, I feel younger, of course, now, but um, I, got, I really was a very, very lucky. Steinhardt had his life back, and with that, a new determination to make the most of it. It took me that many years, 63 years, to, to realize that you just can't live like you did when you were 18. So from here on, he would live with gratitude and appreciation for his new wife, his friends, and for his life's unlikely yet incredible journey. Bill, this is something I haven't told you, but I have really good karma. It turns out that karma is a real thing. Um, not to get too deeply into that, because I'm not, but I just, something, something shines on me every once in a while, and, and my life's okay, you know? The first bit of really good karma happened when he was just four days old. He was adopted. And the doctor brings me over to my parents to the hotel room and goes, here's your baby boy. Wow. So, and I will share this with who anybody wants to listen. It turns out that my, my birth parents were Irish Catholic and Jewish, which is quite a combination. And my, my name on my birth certificate was Baby Boy Flynn. So, and nobody knows that about me. Now, now you're the only other person that knows. <laughs> but uh, so I ended up with a name like Steinhardt. That's, that's quite a leap as well. As fate would have it, Ilsa Steinhardt was a pianist. Milton was head of the music history department at the University of Kansas and a world-class violinist. I had great parents and I, I really, I knew that, but I just, 
I was too busy living my own life, you know. I would have done that differently. How proud were they of you, Rob? They were very proud of me. We were talking earlier that you thought maybe because my dad was the into music history and all that, and it's like spoke Latin and those kinds of things, and my parents were extremely intelligent, that you thought they might be disappointed in the way I went, but they said, we don't care if you, you know, pick up tools and learn a trade, you know, go to trade school if you want, just, just be happy. So I was fortunate enough to, to not be pushed into anything except for playing the violin. They pushed me into playing the violin. And by doing that, they gave him the greatest gift of his life, but also one of his greatest regrets. Oh, maybe the most important thing is since you never appreciate them till you lose them. If you've if you got parents, you know, hang with your parents, man. They aren't here forever. That's a, that's a really good thing. to. Uh, that's one thing I learned. Uh, my parents lived to 86 and 97, but I still didn't spend enough time with them. So that's something I would definitely go back and do. Um, and like people say, I wouldn't change a thing. I almost wouldn't change a thing, but that's one thing I definitely would change. At the age of eight, Robbie began classical training in Vienna, and at 15 was back in Europe playing in orchestras. But he faced a dilemma. He loved the violin, but he also loved rock and thought he'd have to give one of them up. In my mind, I had dropped the violin entirely. Somebody finally said, at about the age of 21 and a half or so, somebody said, you could play that in, in a band, you know? And I go, well, maybe, maybe that could work. Well, did you say, like, give me so, an example? So that, no, but, well, I don't, there wasn't much of an example no. to be had then. But when a local band in Lawrence, Kansas asked him to join, he did. Soon, White Clover became Kansas, and Steinhardt's violin gave them one of the most unique sounds in rock. Still, it took a while to build a following. We loved what we did, we loved playing our music, and we loved playing the music we wanted to play. Um, even though people say, oh, they're so pretentious, and you know, this and that, and I've learned all these big words that I had never heard before, you know. Lackluster was one of them. I'm like, oh, really? Re we are? Really? I mean, I know you might not like our music, but we're certainly not boring on stage. And what an incredible run that band had, with songs like... Carry on my wayward son There'll be peace when you are done Constantly recording, constantly touring, Kansas rarely took breaks, and it eventually took a toll. It's not as easy as you think. It's one of those businesses where you, uh, you hurry up and wait. It, you always hurry up and wait. We've got to be there now, and you get there, and then, you know, you spend 13 hours in the Paris airport. It's no fun. Um, and when you have to do it, it's not vacation. It's not, you know, enjoying seeing the world, you know, and... Uh, yeah, join the Navy and see the world. Join a rock band, see the world. But uh, if you're making buku bucks, then then that's fine. But it, that never really came to fruition for us. After leaving in the 80s and returning, by 2006, Robbie decided it was finally time to go. Yeah, when I finally left, it was I I had, had really had enough. Things were starting to change a bit. Um, uh, different ideas were being thrown around in the band and songs that were coming to us that I didn't actually want to do. And so I just, uh, just one day I ended up just going home. So that was pretty much it. And with his health issues, it almost was. But facing his mortality and the wisdom of age helped Robbie see life from a fresh perspective. I wouldn't have talked to you like this when I was 25 years old. No way. Really? Why yeah. not? Oh, because I thought, I thought I was invincible, like everybody does at that age. 18, 25, well, you pick it. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm extremely thankful. And now I've got, it took me 50 years to find the, the person I really should have been in love with for all my life. So uh, we get along great, and uh, my life's going really well. I'm really happy. Is this the best time of your it life? It is the best time of my life, yeah. How cool is that? It is cool. 67 years old, right? And chances are you have not heard the last of that voice or that violin. He's back on stage with longtime friends in the band Stormbringer to form Robbie Steinhardt and the Music of Kansas. We're hoping to maybe get uh, get some sort of a tour going eventually. It, it would be nice. The best that you know before you fall into 
you're a guy who could spend the rest of his days looking backwards, but you're looking forward. I'm looking forwards, definitely looking forwards. How nice is that? It's good, it's great. It's great to be able to do that. You know, that there's some, there might be something out there for me still. Looks like karma has done it again. Robbie Steinhardt is back with a new focus, new goals, and a whole new appreciation for life. That is an interesting thing. Well, you made me think a lot. I hate it when people make me think. Just, I got enough up there already. One of the most talented, likable, and heartfelt guys around. You know, Robbie's one of the many rockers who've shared their stories on Growing Boulder. Brian Wilson and Mike Love of the Beach Boys have talked about the many obstacles that they faced. For Brian, it was growing up with an abusive father and trying to cope with mental illness. Mike was on the cover of Growing Boulder magazine, where he shared his version of what really went on inside one of the greatest bands in history. Rocker Melissa Etheridge also appeared in Growing Boulder magazine and was a guest on Growing Boulder Radio, where she talked candidly about her professional and personal struggles, including a battle with cancer and how she's chosen to live her life in the years after that diagnosis. And Aaron Neville, whose voice has been an unmistakable part of the American music scene since the 60s, shared how he managed to start Growing Boulder after losing his first wife, and he shares advice for others who are struggling with grief and ready to start surviving and thriving. And you know, Bill, what I love about our candid conversations with celebrities is that, yeah, we do touch on their talent, the reason for their celebrity, but what we really want to focus on is their struggles. Yeah, it's musicians are communicators, and they just love to express themselves. And it's not only a privilege, but it's, it's really interesting to celebrate what these celebrities are well known for and to dig a little deeper. And they're always anxious to share their mistakes, their weaknesses, and their setbacks. And Mark, that is when a good interview turns into a great interview. Yeah, you know, I've come to believe that the most important value of celebrities comes when they remove the facade of greatness and they use the platform that they've built, the megaphone that they control to try to make a difference in the lives of others. And of course, we're only too happy to help facilitate that. You know, one thing that we've learned time and time again is that passion makes life worth living, and shared passions can make living together amazing. Harry and Artis Price have been passionate about one another and the sport that brought them together for more than 60 years now. They're in their 80s, and it's apparent that they've discovered the secrets to longevity in both life and love. This is Harry Price, and this is his wife, Artis. This is Harry and Artist 60 years ago, and this is Harry and Artist today. Harry's 88 and Artist is 85, and they're both getting ready to defend their national championship titles at the U.S. Water Skiing Championships, an elite competition they know a little something about. Let's see, this will be our 56 nationals, and Artis is skiing her, what is it? 50, 55th. 55th national. I'm a year behind, I had yeah. a baby. Our yeah. daughter, Catherine, we took the year off. We've got an osprey right up. Harry and Artis have skied in more U.S. nationals than any man and woman in history, and they have the gold medals and the trophies to prove it. They not only ski against others in their age group, they compete against history. We ski against our world's records, and the 18-year-olds, 16-year-olds ski against their world's records, and whoever comes the closest percentage-wise wins the big trophy. <laughs> and he's won it twice. Harry and Artis met on a diving board introduced by the great Olympic swimming champion Adolf Kiefer. Harry taught Artis how to ski before they were married, and it's been a love affair with one another and with the water ever since. Over the years, they've skied in water shows, been interviewed by Bruce Jenner on the Today Show, and they've won just about every title available, including an award of distinction from the Water Ski Hall of Fame. They'll be eligible for induction into the Hall of Fame when they retire. But that's the catch. They never want to retire. I hope to ski to 100. I expect to ski to 100. This is shaving foam we use. Our bindings are very tight. 
In addition to skiing every other day, Harry, a retired physician, okay. and artist, a retired nutritionist, own a production company and continue to shoot and edit videos, commercials, and documentaries for a wide range of clients, including the Water Ski Hall of Fame, for whom Harry has conducted nearly 200 interviews. Their secret to longevity is pretty simple. Keep skiing while avoiding the obvious dangers. And we did an alligator run, so there's no alligators now. <laughs> they eat a plant-based diet, and they start each and every day with their special routine. We have a, a specific th thing that we do every morning. It's HH. We hug and hang. We have a inversion, inversion a table. And first thing we do when we get up in the morning is hug, and then we go out and hang on the inversion table to get our spines lined up ready for the day. But don't be deceived. Like most their age, they've had to fight through countless aches and pains and injuries and stiffness. But they don't want to live on the couch when they can live on the water. We get each other out. We know that after we get done skiing that we, we feel much better. We have to push each other a little bit, yeah. but after we ski, we feel we better. Feel so better. we know we need to do it. It's just another beautiful day on the backyard lake of two water skiing icons who have discovered that the secret to remaining active is remaining active. Get up and get going. Keep yeah. skiing. Yeah, the, the guy with the big side with the Grim Reapers behind him. Keep going. <laughs> he won't catch up. More inspirational stories featuring ordinary people who are pursuing extraordinary adventures like Harry and artists are available at growingbolder.com slash TV. Across the country, surgeons like Growing Boulder Medical Director Dr. Robert Masson are in emergency rooms, operating rooms, and private practice offices working with patients to help them deal with their pain and helping them live productive, healthy lives. Medicine can work miracles, but the flip side is that more than ever before, the opioid addiction crisis is having a devastating effect. Dr. Masson explains his philosophy on prescribing pain medications and reveals what he and his team are doing to fight against addiction. Find out why he wants every patient, no matter what their issues are, to realize that being pain-free isn't necessarily the goal. God knows narcotics and, and pain medications are not healthy. And, and the more you need, the more you take. The more you take, the less they work. The less they work, the more pain you feel. And it's a self-perpetuating journey into failure and narcotic dependency. And, and right now, I think uh, the country is aware that narcotics uh, are really dangerous. You know, we use them as tools. Everything we use is a tool. There are episodes where you will be in extreme pain and need these narcotics, and we're gonna do the best we can to try to reserve the use of narcotics for those episodes, but not so that you can wither away in bed. The use of those narcotics is best used to actually get you out of bed and to participate in the physical aspect of your recovery. And you know, any, any environment where use of narcotics is really to make you incapable of resuming your performance is misuse of narcotics. So we have a very strategic application of why we want and, and need to use narcotics. If, if your goal is better pain control through narcotics, we're not the right practice. More tips from Dr. Masson and all of our Growing Boulder experts are available online at growingboulder.com slash TV. So what do you want to do with your life? And really the bigger question is, why aren't you out there now pursuing your passions and chasing down your dreams? Jack Gallagher has been running for more than four decades now, and he continues to set and achieve new goals. Recently, he ran the Dublin Marathon in Ireland. He placed first in the over 80 age group. It was his 12th marathon, and he says that it will be his last. He's already working on the next big growing bolder dream. Well, there really are no limits if you believe in yourself, if you refuse to give up and make whatever adjustments or accommodations you have to. Yeah, that's really the key because physical limitations do create obstacles, but there is almost always a way to accommodate and then move forward. If you need some role models who prove that it's not about age, it's about attitude, check this out. Meet the greatest legend in barefoot water skiing history, Banana George Blair. At the age of 93, after countless injuries, surgeries, and illness, is about to put those iconic feet on the water once again. 
how long does he think you can live an active life? <laughs> Forever! <laughs> this is Sandy Scott, the fastest cyclist in the world over the age of 70, and he went from a broken neck to breaking records with times faster than competitors decades younger. The fact that you can be 70 years old and setting personal bests, hello? Quinn Baumelger used to watch dance shows on TV, now others are watching her. In just a few short years, she's become a ballroom dance national champion. I'm come out here dancing like a young kid, so if my body, if God give me ability to do, I'm going to do until I can get up. There are so many others, like Susan Helmrich, who's overcome several bouts of cancer and multiple surgeries to live a life of passion and purpose. Joe Johnston, in his late 60s, who not only built a pole vaulting barn in his backyard, but continues to soar to new heights at Masters track meets across the country. Bernice Bates, who at 92 not only still practices yoga, Guinness named her the oldest instructor in the world. Jim Schaefer, who didn't start lifting weights until his 50s, is winning bodybuilding championships at 75. And this 56-year-old known as the Unigeezer, who hopped on a unicycle for the first time since childhood to become the most popular adventure unicyclist in the country. Now see, these are the stories that we really yeah. love to tell because we can all relate to them. These are ordinary people who happen to be living extraordinary lives and proving that anything is possible simply because they refuse to give in, not because they're supermen or superwomen. Yeah, that's a great point, Bill. It is desire and passion that do make the difference as we age and not genetics. People who age successfully learn to be better problem solvers, better at taking what is and then constructing what can be. They're better at adapting to circumstances and dealing with functional limitations as they age. Age. In a word, they're better at growing bolder. And they're helping us with our main mission, rebranding aging, which is exactly what the Growing Boulder Awards are all about. We're honoring those who are smashing stereotypes, making a difference in their communities, and proving to all of us that the rest of our lives can be the best of our lives with a prestigious Boldy Award. Stay tuned for more about the possibility of the Growing Boulder Awards coming to your city. It's an honor to be recognized for doing something for other people, but most importantly, I'm just totally humbled to be in the presence of such wonderful people. Uh, they were absolutely awesome that received their uh, awards. The Growing Boulder Awards were amazing. They were inspirational. It taught me that I gotta get rid of all the excuses of why I don't have time or why I can't do something and just do it. One of the things I noticed about all of the recipients is they were so humble. Um, they, none of them talked about how wonderful they are. They talked about how humbling this experience is and they were all just amazing people accomplishing, you know, we think extraordinary, they say ordinary, but they are accomplishing extraordinary things. We hope you get the idea by now that it is never too late to move forward and give back. Small acts of kindness can make a big difference in the life of someone else. So our message is this, start growing bolder. It will inspire everyone around you. Finally today, a takeaway message from our friend, colleague, and winner of a Growing Boulder Inspiration Award, Wendy Chioji. Yeah, we hope that it'll motivate you to live the best life possible, and we'll see you on the next Growing Boulder. Hi, I'm Wendy Chioji. Recently, I had a great experience as far as saying yes, getting out of the box and trying some new, potentially terrifying things. Since I'm always telling people to just say yes, I try very hard to do the same. For no other reason than it almost always has led to great adventure. Over the summer, I drove a 500 horsepower Ford Mustang at race car driving school. Even though I was so overwhelmed in the orientation session that I didn't retain a word, I was the only female and came into the program a day late, which was also intimidating. But I got the car to 110 in the backstretch, and I triggered the rev limiter a few times, which means I wasn't driving like a pansy. I also raced the crazy first ever Dirty Bird Mud Run where you take the tram to the top of Snowbird Ski Resort, run down about eight miles tackling 15 obstacles and three slip and slides. I rode Ragbri, a multi-day ride across Iowa with 21,000 of my closest friends on bikes, and there was camping. I went to Columbus, Ohio for the first time and rode Pelotonia, a two-day bike ride that raises millions of dollars for cancer research. 
I ran a rock and roll half marathon for the first time and was pleasantly not disappointed with my performance. I've always opened my heart and mind to possibilities, but haven't always said yes to what presented itself. Saying yes has rarely led me to anything but reward, be it new friends, new experiences, or most often a new adventure of varying degrees of greatness. The next time an opportunity to do something new presents itself, don't just throw out reasons why it won't work. Drive that race car, run that crazy race, camp in Iowa in the summer. Really, what's the worst thing that could happen? And Aaron Nel Neville, Aaron Neville. Let's do that again, because your head moves slightly in there. head moved. It's supposed to be conversational, so. Okay. And if there's one thing I'm good at, Jason, it's making you feel like you were going off the rails in an ad. <laughs> More information about all of the stories you've seen here today is available at growingbolder.com slash TV. And you can get inspired to keep rebranding aging when you connect with the Growing Boulder community on Facebook. Growing Boulder is available on DVD for $19.99 plus shipping and handling. A companion book, Growing Boulder, Rebranding Aging by Mark Middleton, is available as well for $29.99 plus shipping and handling. And you can subscribe to Growing Boulder magazine for $19.99. Order online at growingboulder.com slash TV.